Hey everyone, this is Ross and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits and a lot about vegetables and you know how to use all that stuff in the kitchen and how to grow it and specifically the weird and interesting fruits that maybe a lot of you guys had never heard of or even the interesting varieties, the interesting genetics that could be among even more common fruits like you know, really interesting apples or interesting pears. Um, so in this episode, we're going to be talking a lot about figs and um, actually mostly all figs this this episode because I have a lot of questions that people have been asking me. Um, I finally got back to a lot of my YouTube comments and, and uh, answered as many of those as I could. And I found some comments that were on the videos that were just too long to answer through typing so I figured I'd answer the question through uh, fruit talk and then that way a lot of you guys can get the same advice um, and also I've been getting a lot of que uh, questions on my winterization that I do for these fig trees um, but what do they look like in the winter time how does this all work you know I get this question every summer every fall and every spring it's always the same thing, but I think it's the worst in the fall. So we're going to come out with a number of videos talking about this. But, you know, in reality, I've already covered this many, many times. So we'll get to that in a minute. But let's look at these questions that some people have been asking. Um, Vivi's Little Hobbies had asked a day ago, she said, um, how do you successfully transfer a fig? And uh, what she means is transplant a fig. It was in a shady spot and I moved it to a more sunny location. I dug it up and immediately planted it to a new site. It started to droop. I kept watering it, but it didn't perk up. Well, when you transplant any plant to a new location, the conditions are going to change. The humidity is going to change. The amount of sunlight is going to change. And when you dig something up out of the ground or transplant anything, you're probably going to have some sort of transplant shock. On top of that, you then moved it into a new area with a new environment and that's going to also have some repercussions there with some sort of shock. So, you know, if you were to bring a really extreme version of this is if you were to bring a plant that was inside like a house plant and you were to put that outside, that transition process is really extreme and you could kill your house plant. You could do the same thing with, you know, you just digging up a fig, but they're so resilient that I imagine it's close to impossible if the tree is uh, healthy and strong enough. Um, you know, ideally you should be doing this on a day that's cool, uh, rainy, cloudy. Um, you know, you should be doing this definitely in the fall or in the spring. You don't want to be doing this in the summer. Um, in fact, what you can do when you just transplant them into the new location Take off a lot of those leaves, um, water the thing, not just the, the soil, but water the leaves, you know, give them a nice little spritz because you want to raise the humidity around that area. If you can get it through a couple days in that location, um, it should be okay. You know, it's kind of like taking off an air layer, which we've been doing recently. You take off the air layer. There needs to be a nice balance between the amount of leaves and what's on top and then what's on the bottom, right? So if you don't have enough roots to support what's on top, that's called transplant shock or one form of it. So uh, you need to kind of take a lot of out of the top to support, to help the bottom support the top, right? Um, David Solomon asked, um, I have a fig tree in five gallons, um, water one stream tree. Very nice. Recently started the leaf getting rust brown on the edges of the leaf. Um, how can I treat this rust? Please advise. All right. Well, David, uh, I don't necessarily even know if you have rust. You have to send me a photo. Uh, if the brown, if the edges of the leaves are getting brown, that's not normally a sign of rust. Rust can be all over the leaf, and usually it's not on the edges. Browning of the edges means that. Uh, to me, you, you're you probably overwatering it. And uh, if you're overwatering it, you're giving it um, root rot. The roots are rotting. As we just talked about with Vivi, if uh, your roots are rotting, that means the top is not going to be able to be supported by what's on the bottom because some of the roots 
are rotting. So you're going to have less on the bottom and more on top. And as a result, a lot of these trees, not just figs, but all plants will start getting brown on their outer edges. It also just could be because of age. You know, this just could be something that happens as time goes on. You know, fig leaves look less and less pristine as time goes on. All leaves look less and less pristine. Susan Coleman asked, uh, let's see, hello Ross, I enjoy all of your videos and I'm an avid watcher. It's been eight or nine months since this video. Um, how was the Quiet Heat 15 done for you through March? This is a heater that I promoted that we talked about our, my greenhouse and kind of what I've been doing in the greenhouse to get everything started and how the whole greenhouse was kind of set up and all that. She said she's looking into getting one of these heaters for my new greenhouse. It will have a double double layered poly with a fan for air insulation. Can you leave the tarp off and still get the figs to be dormant till March? Also, you showed the photos with the heater outside the greenhouse. Um, how does this heat or is it just for photos? My greenhouse is tw uh, 12 feet by 24 feet, which is 288 square feet. Do you have a contact person for the quiet heat distributors? How much water do the figs need to take them out of dormancy until they're placed outside? Thanks for doing all these videos. I've learned a lot, Sue. So yeah, that's a lot of questions to answer um, that just won't suffice by me typing. Um, so. I guess the first question is the heater. The heater is fantastic. It did really well for me this winter time. It's way better than any other heater I've ever had. Um, it really kept that thing warm. I didn't have to even run it that many times. Um, in fact, I ran it this winter. It was pretty mild, but I ran it this winter only 10 times. Um, though I'm in the Philadelphia area, I don't know where you live, Sue. Um, the tarp over top of the greenhouse is really just there to keep things warmer. And I would suggest the same thing with your greenhouse. A lot of people, what they do is they put, you know, a frost cloth over top or some kind of another layer or something over top to really get this thing uh, insulated better. If you have a double layer of poly and you have a fan inflating that in between, you probably won't need any insulation because that's a great amount of insulation as it is. You really should think about that and research into that fan that can inflate the air in between the two layers of poly. That's like an R5 insulation that's really inexpensive to use. You, you won't even need a heater. Um, <clears throat> so you, you might not even need a tarp as well. Uh, let's see here. Uh, she's also asked me, the heater outside the greenhouse was not just for photos. I took it out of the greenhouse just to show you guys what it looked like. Um, I don't have a contact person at the, uh, I forget, I don't even remember what the company name is to be honest with you, but they're, you know, that's a really nice heater. So I definitely would recommend it. There's other heaters that will do the same exact thing. Um, and believe it or not, um, I'm not entirely sure if that heater is going to cover that big of a greenhouse. You may need two of them. You may not need any, you know, uh, it's really is. There's more information I need to be able to say, you know, you're going to need a heater. I don't even know where you live. You know, I don't know what temperatures are like, uh, in the wintertime. I don't know what you're growing inside the greenhouse. Um, what I do know is that that heater will probably fill up a, It will heat a, I would say a 15 by 15 room pretty damn well, especially if it's it's enclosed. Um, I've had it in our living room and that's about 15 by 15, somewhere around there. Um, maybe 15 by 10 and it heats up that living room like you wouldn't believe. The greenhouse is only six by eight and it heats up that thing. It's like a joke, you know, I, I barely have to run the thing um, for very long. It really puts out a nice heat that doesn't seem as dry either. I only had one plant this winter time that got hit with the, that heater in a direct blast and that was the only one to get damaged. Um, whereas every other tree in the greenhouse was, uh, was not damaged this year, which is kind of crazy. Um, but I think it has a lot to do with that I wasn't 
I wasn't, um, it wasn't necessary for me to run the heater all the time. Like I said, I only ran it for like 10 nights. Uh, Brittany the Vampire Slayer said, I recently got a small fig tree, maybe three feet tall. I'd love to plant it outdoors eventually. I'm in zone 6A and wasn't sure if it'd be better to plant in the fall or pot it up and wait till next spring. Definitely wait until next spring. Um, this is a very common question. We just kind of talked about this with our air layer video that we did on Saturday. This past Saturday, um, we talked about basically me planting them now to get them more established before the winter comes. However, I'm protecting them. And if you're not willing to protect them from the cold, it's very likely that they're going to die. Um, you also need to plant them the right way. You need to plant a couple of those nodes below the soil. And, you know, for whatever reason, it does die because uh, it's too cold out. Definitely in 6A, it's too cold. If you were to bury some of those nodes, you'd have some nodes that will come back from the base below the soil, and that's how you would reestablish your tree in the spring. But I would just wait till the spring. Kenneth McKibben says, uh, Ross, have you tried drying any of the lower rated figs since the more bland and watery figs might stand out when their flavors are concentrated? I did do that. Um, I have. I've dried some of these figs quite a bit. Um, I've experimented with that. There's nothing like getting a dried fig straight off the tree. And someone else had commented in the comments I had kind of gone through as well, sort of asking me a similar thing. If you can get a, a fig to dry directly on the tree, it's way better than if you were to take it off the tree and then put it in a dehydrator. Um, it's just better. And even when you dry them, the flavor doesn't really it does get concentrated but it's not really that much any better because all it has is just less water um, but it still has the same flavor the flavor is almost the same so in it's only really about a half a star better let's say you know if the if the poor fig was only a three out of five then drying it would make it only maybe like a three out of five and yeah some figs are meant for drying and that's what their specific purpose is but um, you know it's a different kind of drying than you know what you're kind of talking about I think uh, a lot of these figs when they dry on the tree like that it's a it's a different drying process and they they end up looking quite different and yeah well we can experiment with that just a bit I want I'm interested to see maybe I should take some more off and and dry some but for the most part, the answer to your question is it's not really worth doing. But, you know, I'm not going to say don't do it. It's, you know, it's worth the experimenting. But, you know, to go back to what we were talking about in the beginning, our second part of this episode here, we're going to talk about the, the fig tree timeline. This is um, a blog post that I made on my blog. It's figboss.com for those of you guys who haven't have it been there? Go down to the bottom of the blog, by the way, guys, and put your email in here. It'll, you'll be um, you'll be basically notified when there's a new a new blog post. Um, this is one that I think really people should pay a lot of attention to. It's actually got 382 views, which is which is not bad. But uh, this is one of them I think is like a guide to everybody no matter what time of the year it is. Um, I filled this in here all the way from the beginning of the season to the end of the season of every little thing that you should be doing for the most part for your tree. And this doesn't apply to everybody because it depends on where you guys live, but um, you know, this is definitely what to do here in the Philadelphia area. Um, and it lists the exact dates of what to do. So in March, um, we start the fig shuffle, right? We turn on the heater in the greenhouse. We get everything going. Everything's starting to wake up, and um, we keep everything above 32 degrees Fahrenheit at this point. Um, you know, we can do some root pruning before this time if we want. We can do some transplanting before this time. Any other pruning that we need to do before these trees wake up, all this should be done. And then once, you know, we start to really want to wake these things up it's a good idea to rehydrate the the soil rehydrate the tree rehydrate the roots um and this will just make it a much more easier and more natural um, transition out of dormancy um, at this point you know it's a good idea for the trees that 
are not yet dormant. You got to keep them still. If they're not dormant, um, but they are also dormant, the minimum temperature is 17 degrees Fahrenheit. But then once they wake up, you got to keep them above 32. And, and um, you definitely should try to keep them above 50. I mean, these colder temperatures, are they're more sensitive, not necessarily when they first wake up, but they're more sensitive uh, when they start putting out a few leaves to really cool temperatures. So I would recommend when they've got like two or three leaves on them, you know, keep them above 60 minimum. Um, so then we go into other things like using dormant oils. You can do that when your trees are dormant. And we talk about fertilizing and thinning the new shoots. And this is kind of just like an overview of every single thing we did this year. Um, and it goes into more detail here. We have videos on every single thing that we've done. Pinching, um, talking about mulch and talking about stopping the fertilizer and then um, reducing our water trying to get these things to lignify, picking up any fallen leaves for potential rust issues. All this is covered and we're now in October. It's almost October 1st. So we're basically right now just trying to reduce our water, pick up any leaves that are falling on the ground, pick up any fruit that maybe has split, you know, try to keep the SWD numbers down um, and just try to get our trees to stop growing and to lignify. That's like the number one key here. We want them all lignified, all brown and hard, so that when we go into um, our dormancy process, when we take cuttings, they're gonna be the highest qu uh, quality of cuttings possible. And also this just is great for the health of the tree. We wanna have our, our trees get hit with a couple frosts, two to three frosts. December 1st is really when I would say they're all completely dormant at that point. Sometime between November 1st and December 1st, we should have a few frosts that come in and get these things um, dropping their leaves and nice and dormant. And again, it's the same process. When we put them away for dormancy, you can put them anywhere you want. You just have to keep them above 17 degrees Fahrenheit, but you want to keep them below 40. And I would say 50, but 40 really to be safe. Cause if it's a, you know, if your trees are sitting at 50 degrees Fahrenheit for an extended period of time, they're going to wake up and they're going to wake up too soon. And if you don't have access to sunlight in your storage area, they're going to put out this nice crappy, lanky growth that's pale green and doesn't do anything and and on in all honesty it ruins your entire season your entire season is just almost completely ruined at this point um you're you're behind like an entire month your trees have to really recover from this this is a real rookie mistake is letting your trees wake up too soon and also a big rookie mistake is not letting your tree go dormant you want them all to go dormant you want them all to get hit with a couple frosts with the exception of a few, you know, newly rooted cuttings that haven't lignified up that are very weak trees. You don't want to let them get hit with a frost, but everything else should, everything else should be dormant and your weaker trees that aren't, um, you don't want to let them get hit with a frost. Let them lignify up a bit and then put them back outside, you know, keep them inside for a bit and let them kind of go dormant. The, the better that they go dormant, the more naturally they go dormant the better off your season is going to be with that particular tree the following year. Um, it really does make a huge difference here. Um, so I, I think that's mostly it, you know, but if you, if you keep them above 17 degrees Fahrenheit, they won't take damage. But if you, like I said, you keep them around 40, they won't wake up and you can store them almost anywhere where you have that temperature range. Um, you know, I put them out in the greenhouse, which is heated. We put a tarp over it, we insulate it, and then we have a heater in there that keeps it above 20 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. Um, I've had them go down to 14 degrees Fahrenheit and they took no damage, but I wouldn't mess with that. You know, I think 17 degrees Fahrenheit is a good solid number for almost all the varieties that exist. Keep them above 17. Um, and don't keep them at 17 for an extended period of time. Um, yeah, and then, you know, if you keep them above 17, you're going to be good. But um, the other places I put them in are you can put them in your garage. You can put them in 
a root cellar. I think a root cellar is a wonderful place for them. You know, because in a root cellar that's underground or has a an, an interesting microclimate in it, it doesn't get too warm, it doesn't get too cold in it, and the process of it changing temperature is very gradual. So by the time the spring comes around, it's already more a natural process of them being woken up. It's actually one of the best places I think to keep them. You can even dig a giant hole, stick them in the hole, and cover the hole with a piece of wood. You know, um, create a little fig burial, uh, like a grave for these things. Um, you know, people put them in their garage. They put them in man-made, you know, type structures. Um, people put them in their cold basement. And I think this is the worst place of all the possibilities. This is the worst one. Um, because a lot of people have a cold basement that's not cold come March and then they have their trees usually in February or March that are waking up and they have to sit in their cold basement and, and again that's when you have that issue where it gets that pale green growth that's very spindly and it just sets you up for a really horrible season so um, keep them away from the basement that's for sure plus who wants to be dragging these things up and down uh, stairs that's a lot of work um, and then once they're dormant and they're sitting there dormant, I would make sure that they're mulched. Before they go in their dormancy process, uh, before you put them away, I should say, is water them in really well. And make sure the soil is soaked and the water comes out the bottom of the pot. And then I would add mulch. And um, that mulch is gonna keep that consistent soil moisture. And if you do everything right, like I just said, you won't even have to water them all winter time. Um, with the mulch. If you don't have enough mulch, you will. If you have them in a heater and there's a heater blasting on them, you're going to have to water them. It really depends on your environment. Maybe you have a little bit of a moister condition and that way a lot of that water is not going to evaporate out. But I think a general rule of thumb is about four ounces of water per tree per month um, for all the dormancy process. So four ounces you know, in December, or I should say four ounces in January, four ounces in February. But you could probably even skip January, um, four ounces in March and April, and then that's it. You know, once they come outside in May or even halfway through April is what I like to do, you just water them in well. And by watering them in, that's gonna rehydrate them like we said back here in March and April, start the rehydration process. So, you know, that's pretty much it, guys. I just recommend this little, this article here, this blog that we created earlier this year. It's really going to help you guys out. Sticky this, you know, put this, print it out or something and put it on your freaking bulletin board. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this little episode here of Fruit Talk. Um, this should definitely help a lot, a lot of people. So thank you guys for watching this one. We'll see you next week. Uh, take care, everyone.